Good morning. It's good morning in University College Cork in Ireland. It may be your good afternoon. Um, you're very welcome. This is Visioning the Future Artistic Doctorates in Ireland Research Project, and this is our online seminar series. This is the third of our seminars, and we're very excited this morning to have Annette Irlander here today. Um, I wanted to just let you know that these seminars are all being recorded and they will be used um, as part of this research project and they'll also be located on our website. So without further ado, um, I am going to pass over to my colleague Yvonne Bonenfant, who's the head of theatre, who will be chairing today's session. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, welcome everyone here. Um, I'm really delighted that Annette Arlander is here with us this morning. I will introduce Annette properly after the video she has prepared for us, the video presentation. It's delightful to have some moments to think about the intersection between uh, artistic research and performative practices generally. Um, just so that everyone knows, please feel free to use the Q&A tab that you see at the bottom of your screen to ask questions during the video presentation. Um, you also, after the video presentation, will be able to ask questions either by using the Q&A tab and typing them or by putting your hand up uh, using um, the hand icon to ask your question uh, live. Um, questions will be moderated uh, by Inesh Bentukweyu after our, uh, after Annette's uh, video and uh, my proper introduction of Annette and our first questions. Thanks very much for being here this morning. One moment, please. Hello, uh, my name is Annette Arlander, and this is an informal pre-recorded uh, introduction to a conversation titled Principles of Artistic Research in Performance Doctorates. Although the title speaks of principles, I prefer in the following to speak of tensions, which somehow relate to debates about potential principles. Of course, and some of the tensions are historical, not so hotly debated anymore. And what might seem like dichotomies or polarities are often continuums or fields with uh, sometimes more than two poles, and they do not necessarily exclude each other. So excuse my simplifications or like making, yeah, simplifications. But some basic tensions come from the terminology used and the associations related to the terms, beginning with the term performance. So do we speak of performance? Do we mean performing arts? Do we mean performance art? Performance as such goes beyond art, including sports, religious rituals, popular entertainment, performances of identity and so on. But it, it is of course today uh, also used to refer to stage performances, or performing arts more generally, like music performances, dance performances, theatre performances, and so on. Here it obviously refers to something more limited, uh, because it does not include film, music, or even dance. So what is left? Performance art? Or perhaps theatre? I spent a long time as professor of performance art and theory, very aware of the tension between performance art, like action art, body art, conceptual art, and performing arts. Performance art is a good place to investigate the tensions between performing arts and visual arts or fine art in the context of artistic research and the different problems emerging from the different disciplinary traditions. That I have discussed in a text with a strange title, Characteristics of Visual and Performing Arts in 2011. Uh, I, I add the references in, uh, at the end of this video. The relationship between performance as research, which is an established methodol methodology today, and artistic research, I have discussed in a more recent text called Introduction to Future Concerns, Multiple Futures of Performance as Research in 2018. But uh, that is only the term performance. What about the doctorate? One historical debate has been about uh, Doctor of Art or PhD. 
And a little bit the same has happened to the term PhD as to performance, that it has become a, general, a generic title. Nobody thinks of it as being doctor of philosophy. But uh, in my history, I'm a doctor of art. Uh, there was um, um, a division created at some point between doctor, doctorate with artistic emphasis or with scientific emphasis. Um, and this uh, reflected the historical development, for instance, especially in music that, in Finland, that there was a development of doctorates based on artistic excellence. So the idea of equivalence, not that uh, we would speak of artistic research, but there was artistic excellence on the one hand, with, for instance, five concerts or five, uh, five stage so shows directed, and then a PhD, which was written, and they would be like equivalent amount of work. And this equivalence model was supported by some people to, to uh, safeguard the, the, the sort of the freedom of the arts, but it uh, deteriorated to the very opposite, uh, make, un, making it not possible to, to create experimental art, but to have to sort of demonstrate excellence and so on. Uh, this was linked to the question of further education of the artist. So uh, in the beginning there was debates about should a doctorate, because it's a third cycle degree, include the idea that you become a better artist by, by doing the doctorate? Or are you a better artist if you have a doctorate? And the, the tension between this claim and then the idea that, that it should be a research degree. So uh, that artists would be training to become researchers, uh, producing contributions to knowledge uh, with the help of their own artistic methods. And then, of course, the third dimension is the question of ped pedagogy, because most doctors of art or uh, will uh, in the future teach and uh, supervise other doctors. A third tension uh, comes from uh, uh, the question of a contribution to general philosophical knowledge or uh, within humanities or social sciences, or a contribution to the development of the art form or the professional field, um, which are not this, uh, necessarily the same, the art form of performance or the art form of uh, uh, professional municipal theatres, uh, the, the sort of the professional field of uh, the theatre, uh, cultural industry or show business or however you want to speak of it. So, um, or, or live art, for instance. Uh, so, uh, for instance, in, in the Nordic countries, in Norway and Sweden, there has been, uh, because the major uh, art schools in performing arts have not been universities until recently, there was something called artistic development work, which was really development of artistic work, which uh, influences contemporary ideas of artistic research as well. Thus, there are different types of artistic research already within the Nordic context. There is uh, one strand with the professional knowledge articulated, like any professional knowledge. Nurses, policemen, actors uh, acquire uh, knowledge through their working history and that there are specific methods to try to articulate that knowledge. Or then there is the tradition of, of uh, seeing uh, artistic research and experimental art as very much linked. And especially when experimentation becomes more and more difficult within uh, uh, commercial arts, uh, like performing arts often are, uh, then the, the, the pressure for, for sort of experimental art and artistic research, research-based art, so to speak, uh, grows stronger. Then there is uh, the tension of the relationship to theory, of course, that's a big issue. Uh, Theory-driven research or, or um, uh, theoretical notions derived from experience. We like to think that we are doing practice-led or practice-based research or practice as research and developing concepts from the practice, but, but that is actually very difficult and most uh, um, artist research, and especially on doctoral level, they, they use uh, theoretical notions from other fields which brings in the, the fifth tension of artistic research as interdisciplinarity. On the one hand, between art and academia, or between art and some other discipline, like, like uh, art and pedagogy, or art and ethnography, or art and science, which is art and science collaborations, you're 
all, all know about, or a literature and so on. Uh, for example, in Helsinki, the Department of Arts Education in Dance and Theatre uh, had a strong influence um, from social sciences on artistic research in performing arts in general, while in the visual arts, the, the arts education was uh, education took place in another university, so that link was uh, not existent in the same way. Of course, there is uh, one big tension, but that's maybe on a meta level concerning more like policies than, than the individual uh, doctoral researcher, is the question of the doctorate as an academization of art, uh, or, um, or the doctorate as an emancipation of the artist. So the, the critique of the academization of art paradoxically is often a conservative standpoint, wanting to keep art and knowledge apart by protecting artistic freedom. Uh, and the doctorate as emancipation and democratization of knowledge, uh, part of the legacy of cultural studies in a way that everybody's voice should be heard. Also, the artist's voice should be heard, not only um, the critics, the, the curators and producers and historians should be able to speak about a performance work and so on. Um, artistic research as research through art. Uh, is one thing, so using your your methods, your your skills to, to investigate, or as an extension of artistic principles to critically investigate the field of artistic research itself as a form of expanded institutional critique is another issue. And of course, institutional critique is not so prominent in performing arts, but, but could be. Then there is a seventh tension, um, the balance between artistic output and written reflection. So from, uh, from on one hand, no written part at all, except uh, maybe a website and, and documentation of artworks, to only a written part, uh, which is to either to some extent poetic or fictional, like an artwork, or then just um, in some other manner encompass, encompasses the, the artist's uh, perspective. Uh, there are examples of, of this in, both in Sweden and in Finland. And, and then uh, should the written part be an exegesis of the practice, an exposition of the practice, somehow demonstrate and, and explain the practice, or uh, should it be seen as a parallel or separate theoretical work approaching the, the que research question or topic um, uh, from another angle? So the theoretical work and the artistic work existing sort of side by side. And this is often preferred by many artists who don't want to speak about their practice necessarily. Um, and of course, then there is a lot of tensions in the question how to write, what kind of style to use. Should, should we allow a personal account, a poetic text or a process description? Should there be a focus on experience? Or should the, the format be more of a traditional thesis with introduction to previous research and contextualization of your contribution by writing about other artists' work, uh, like in art research and, and theatre history and so on? Um, and, and more specifically, when you explicate, if you explicate and when you explicate your process, how much focus on mistakes and failures uh, to avoid a, a style of sort of marketing yourself as an artist? Or should you, on the contrary, be celebrating the innovations and openly marketing them for others to use, and so on? And of course, the, the one major tension is uh, how strictly should we follow general third cycle degree requirements, and, or, or, and how much should we claim a special position of freedom for the arts. Of course, freedom for the arts is never so celebrated in performing arts. Uh, paradoxically, they're never so free uh, as in, in visual arts, uh, simply not only for economic reasons, but because there is the spectator, the audience. Some of the tensions uh, uh, specific to performing arts, uh, not necessarily performance art, but uh, to the same degree, but, but especially to theater and, and performing arts, uh, are related to, also music and dance, of course, are related to, to differences in relationship to the notion of work. I have suggested a, a sort of a four field uh, with combinations of, of either product-oriented or practice-led artistic research on the one hand, 
and then either developmental or future-oriented and reflective or sort of backward-looking artistic research on the other hand, which can be combined in different ways. Of course, um, this uh, reflection can mean try, trying to not only to reflect uh, on your own process of creating the, the, the work or, or developing the practice you're engaged with, but it could be like articulating the tacit knowledge existing within the field. Uh, I, I quote, quote briefly from a text called Artistic Research as Situated Practice Performing with Legion, which deals about where I talk about my own work, but there is a chapter hidden which, is, uh, which explains this forefield. I quote, research which entails an attempt to articulate and theorize an ongoing practice based on acquired and thus more or less unconscious skills often has a different focus and uses different methods compared with research that tries to develop and conceptualize an artwork or a new type of design product or performance and explain the route to that result we could therefore distinguish di distinguish on one hand product oriented or object led artistic research focused on the creation of an artwork or design product or a, a performance uh, from, uh, on the other hand, practice-based or practice-led research engaged with an, with an ongoing practice, often with a practical, critical or emancipatory knowledge interest. To make it simple, we could say that artistic research can be product-oriented when the main goal is the creation of a work or practice led when a particular form of practice is more important than a specific artwork or performance. If you think of improvising musicians or improvising actors or improvising dancers, who where is the work? It's like a slice of the practice. Any slice could be seen as the work. Of course, this distinction could be attributed to traditions within the creative and the performing arts respectively, but these fields are increasingly blurred today and contemporary art, for example, often focuses on processes and interaction rather than products, uh, products and finished works. And in performing arts, practices or methods of teaching and pre pre methods of training can very much be reified into object-like products. Another dimension concerns the relationship to time, as I already mentioned. The research projects can be developmental, striving to create something new, experimentation, experimental uh, innovation, whatever. It can also be reflective, trying to understand and articulate what one has already done. Either approach or rather emphasis on either aspect can be found within artistic research, although you would expect the developmental to dominate. Uh, well, this is my bias. For the critically minded, however, the reflective approach provides a space for questioning and criticizing the ingrained conventions of the art world. For the more conservatively inclined, it offers an opportunity to formulate and document tacit knowledge and to articulate methods within an existing tradition. In some areas, for instance, the first uh, doctoral uh, candidate I supervised was a lighting designer. So, so to articulate the knowledge in that field and to, to, to somehow, yeah, well, I, we can use the speak of that in the discussion. But anyway, I'm overstep my time, but I tried to summarize this. So we can form a classical field combining these four aspects, product oriented and developmental, practice led and developmental, product oriented and reflective, practice led and reflective. Of course, creating this kind of typology can seem like a useless habit borrowed from social sciences, but it could be clarifying if we remember that most cases of artistic research include all these aspects in some degree. As generic examples, we could imagine a research project aiming at developing a technological innovation, it's product oriented and developmental, or a new method, it's practice led and developmental, or a research project trying to understand the responses to an artwork or performance, product-oriented and reflective, or criticizing a traditional teaching technique, practice-led and reflective. In real life, clear-cut examples are hard to find. Nearly all research projects, for instance, include a reflective or backward-looking component simply because they are reported. And all forms of artistic research could be called speculative practices uh, or experimental practices because the speculation, the imagining of alternative modes takes place with the help of and through the practice. So, end of quote. But of course, there are, I just uh, mentioned quickly, we can discuss them more in, there are um, other tensions, uh, especially in theatre performance production, like tension between collaboration and individual work. Uh, 
then uh, the re research traditions tend to focus on individual work, whereas whereas uh, art production in performing arts is often very much collaboration. There is also a tension between professional roles and auteur position or, or, or artist position. Like in a theater production, light designer, mask creator, costume designer, and so on, have a different role than director, uh, playwright, or choreographer. And there are hierarchical production practices uh, which uh, don't make it, uh, it's not uh, as easy for everybody to, to take the position of an individual researcher. Of course, there is also a historical tension between professional and amateur practitioners, which is, uh, for instance, in Finland, in theatre, it's very strong, and the, the, the professional um, um, qualifications are very much protected uh, within the, within the industry, so to speak. But maybe the main uh, provider of tension is, of course, the role of the audience as co-creator. Because it's not possible to go too far in experimentation if you don't get the audience with you. So therefore, one of the main uh, uh, tensions in performing arts, or especially in theatre, I would say, is between experimentation, um, cutting-edge exploration, versus articulating tacit knowledge of existing traditional practices in the industry or show business. There is an inherent conservatism in much theatre, sometimes even anti-intellectualism, paradoxically, coming from maintaining traditional ways of working and a, and a dislike of analyzing instead of gut feeling and so on. So there is a tension between so-called free art, however free that ever is, and the demand of the show business, however fringe one wants to see one's show business. I, I guess you can find more tensions in the discussion. Uh, to summarize briefly, there are very many views of what constitutes proper artistic research. And for me personally, remembering to acknowledge this diversity and supporting differentiation, actually, rather than trying to create uh, consensus, is important and valuable and sort of um, helps in maintaining a healthy research environment. And now some links, but thank you for your attention. Right. Thank you so much, Annette, for that discussion. Uh, and um, as usual, uh, I am stunned by um, your brilliant ability to verbally map. And I imagine the map uh, um, in my head and was mapping, listening to you during that recording. Um, an interesting Oslandarian moment, too, because it really felt to me, since you are there, like you were speaking now. <laughs> This is a really interesting performance moment. So I will just take a moment to introduce um, Annette properly now. So everybody, you've experienced the video. Um, uh, Annette is a doctor of arts. She's a renowned artist, researcher, and pedagogue. She is the former professor of performance art and theory, um, first at the University of Arts Helsinki and then at the University of Arts Stockholm and is now working um, on the project and with the project, meetings with remarkable and unremarkable trees. And I strongly encourage you to have a look at um, that uh, area, meetingswithtrees.com. Um, I just add that for myself, Annette has been a huge influence, as far as I'm concerned, on the critical development of artistic research internationally. Uh, she's been extremely active in working groups at both the International Federation of Theater Research and Performance Studies International. Um, and I personally find your work, Annette, uh, incredibly inspiring and always have, and also find the way that you speak about your work very inspiring. Um, so uh, there is an introduction and, and um, uh, 
Uh, I might also just say to the people present, it would be, you know, if you're interested, and that's really um, exhaustive work, and that is one of the pioneers of uh, performance and artistic research intersecting with one another. Uh, um, she has done also amazing work if you go to her website and just follow um, on to some of her expositions on the Society for Artistic Research's research catalog. You can have a look at uh, um, uh, chronologies of work that Annette has done both as artist and academic. So Annette, welcome um, to Ireland virtually. <laughs> um, I might just uh, kick off with a question for you. Um, there's so much in this presentation and what I appreciate most because perhaps I come down in the same political camp is your insistence that, um, not insistence, but your suggestion that the plurality of uh, approaches to artistic research and particularly inside this container that we call the doctorate is one of the things that's most interesting about it. Um, but I'll just lead on, you know, with a question about the experience of the doctoral student. One of the things that means is that each doctoral student is having, unlike in many other disciplines, and particularly in performance practices where both the audience and um, what you've called industry conservatism or hierarchies in the sense that there are established ways of doing things in collaboration. One of the problems or challenges of the doctoral container is that students are having to continually justify their particular intersection of doctoral approach because there is no standard format, so to speak, in many territories. So added on to uh, the model of the doctorate is some form of discourse that justifies why the doctorate was done this way. Um, sometimes that's done verbally in, a, in an examination, an oral examination. Sometimes it's actually part of the writing. Um, I wonder if you might comment on some of the difficulties that you think students have had grappling with that challenge in your career, that challenge of justifying not only what they're doing, but why they're doing it the way they're doing it. Well, um, thank you for, for your introduction to begin with, but, but to jump directly into the question, because I'm sort of the first generation in, in Finland, I think it was actually easier when you were expected to invent the wheel. So, so now, uh, it might be more difficult because you have more choice. There is more, there is more examples and, you, and so on. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, and many people would like to have clear models. So, okay, if this is practice-led research, what, are, what is practice-led research compared to practice as research, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, but actually the freedom to, to articulate the, what am I looking for? and in what manner I'm looking for it, and why is it important, is really important to maintain. So it doesn't mean that anything goes. It's, it only means that, that don't look at the stage design now, because I'm, I'm working with the voice. Or, or don't, because when we, in performing arts, there is, um, like from one show, you could make uh, 10 doctorates in a way, because there are different dimensions. It doesn't make it easier though. And, and of course, uh, there will be local traditions. So, so um, in some sense, the situation today is, which tradition am I going to link to? So you can't sort of pretend that you're inventing the wheel. You have to link to a tradition, but you can choose what tradition in a way, or, or which people you refer to. This, is, this would be my advice. Right, and I wonder too, one of the things that you began to address that I think um, has, is often attention in different systems. Of course, one of the other things that comes into play is sometimes the labels for what is called artistic research are actually controlled by uh, social dimensions like what you can get funding for. Mm -hmm. um, which is sort of how the term research creation evolved in Canada. It was very much about what a research council in particular could understand as uh, artistic research. And um, I think there's a good argument that PAR evolved in the UK in similar circumstances. Mm -hmm. These, um, one of the things you point out is that there can then be this kind of uh, um, hostility and suspicion from 
the professional art sector around whether somebody be, who is working inside the doctoral container is actually uh, um, working within parameters of virtuosity that mean the art is still art. Um, and you sketched that out in a really interesting way. You sketched out that tension in really interesting ways. Can you tell us something about how you've seen your students navigate, particularly in performance, or you've seen people you've examined navigate that tension um, where they are both having to justify their work as researchers and to a wider performative art world as being of as being either valid or of esteem or worth funding? Well, <clears throat> this is uh, slightly different in the different Nordic countries. So, so mm. in Finland, there has been more, partly because of the pedagogy, uh, the legacy of the, the teacher investing, you know, but the, for other reasons, um, there has been more emphasis on, on the research dimension and not only enforced, but people have sort of wanted to, to make research, even artists like um, after me, I, my work wasn't so theoretical, but Girsi Monni was writing about dance research in sort of very, very heavily Heideggerian uh, sort of critiquing the representationalist understanding of dance and so on. So uh, whereas um, in, in Sweden and Norway, there has been a very strong emphasis on uh, art first, the quality of art. So the excellence in art uh, is the main thing. And also what they, uh, I did, I was, uh, in Norway uh, as part of the national board for doctoral program for a few years and they always spoke of the the, the faglige the faglige and what is the faglige I was like what is it's the professional so how does this contribute to the professional field so it's not enough that it's in interesting knowledge for the academia if you make a doctorate in art in directing it has to have some relevance for theater directors or for the 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 theater community so so there is but of course and that's uh, fine in some sense uh, but there is uh, because of this very strong professional legacy there are like two dangers it's not only uh, academia that is dangerous threat but also free art is a dangerous threat to the to the professional knowledge you know so so there is this triangulation of, of horrible waters uh, but the other, the other question, which I just touched upon, and which was like hushed in the very beginning, it was really like you shouldn't speak about that. It's the demand for further education for artists, and this remains today. If I'm an artist and I want to improve, I want to to get uh, more knowledge and skills and understanding and and sort of get on with my artwork. What should I do? So uh, contribute to academia. Well, uh, I'm not. Uh, I think these these are real tensions, and uh, mm. and uh, it's a challenge to work with them. In the beginning, it was like some um, professional artists were making shows, and they were sort of hiding from the audience that this was a research project. Mm. It was only revealed. To, to the examiners, but, but the audience shouldn't be scared by the fact that this is a research project and so on. I don't know. I'm not familiar enough with the situation in Ireland, so I don't know what is relevant for you at the moment. But, but I remember Timothy Emlyn Jones uh, meeting him, a fine artist who wrote from Ireland, who wrote about the processes of art, sometimes being very similar to processes of research and so on. Yeah, now this is sidetrack. Sure, oh yes. And, and um, what we'll do is <clears throat> we'll hand over to Inesh in a moment who can field questions from uh, right. the Q&A that are coming up and, and she will do that. I just want to uh, appreciate your um, underscoring of the fact that uh, the, the line you used, free art can be a threat to art. <laughs> And I think it's really important that um, when we are dialoguing between academ academia and the wider uh, art world, that we don't forget that art can be very conservative too. 
It's not just academia that can be very conservative. Mm -hmm. The value systems that police art can also be very conservative. Um, let's pass over to Inesh. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, Annette, for a beautiful presentation. It was really insightful. Um, one of the questions mentioned, and I think it's these two questions that go a little bit into what you've been discussing already, which is about the tension mentioned between experimentation and the audience and the notion that a PhD doesn't necessarily need an audience in the conventional sense because it's also an experimental space that can experiment uh, not outside of the black cube. So the question is, uh, if you do see a value for the PhD as a space of, for experimentation that might not otherwise be possible or achievable in the more um, outside the PhD framework. Absolutely. I think this is one, one development that is already very clearly seen, that instead of sort of the first generation articulating the tacit knowledge of exist, sort of trying to articulate the way things have been done, sort of creating material for, for teaching, for instance, and, and, and all this. Now, because of, of the funding situation and the development of the art world, there is a rush of experimental artists to, to do uh, PhDs or doctorates because that's the haven where you can do experimental work. And paradoxically, that's why I started to do my doctorate in the beginning in the 90s. I thought that would be a way to legitimize that I wasn't so interested in getting as many people in the audience as possible because that was the normal sort of what you are supposed to want. And, and I wanted the audience, sure. So I don't think paper exercises are enough. Sometimes they can be, but often in performing arts, you need to experiment with an audience, but then you could invite an audience that is, is somehow, in Swedish you would say infrastod, who is aware of participating in an experiment and, and in stretching the tensions and so on. Because absolutely, that's one possibility for artistic research is really to do research that is not possible in, in, the, in the professional context. So, so I know there are tensions and here with the amateurism comes in and so on and so on. There will be critique, but I think that space for experimentation needs to be defended. Thank you. And um, in terms of that space for experimentation and what you spoke about of the performing arts tensions where the audience, one of them is uh, specific for the performing arts where the audience is a co-creator. Um, you mentioned something about not being possible to go too far in experimentation if you don't take the audience with you. And I think that is one of the particular challenges of artistic research uh, in performance. Oh, I wonder if you could expand a little bit on that. Well, I, I, don't, um, I don't have a solution. But of course, uh, um, in today's world, audiences are differentiating too. And there are audiences that are willing to do all kinds of weird immersive experiments or one-to-one -one shows and so on. So, so if we let go of the idea of sort of a homogeneous, large, like Hollywood audience, you know, like, like if, if, if we let go of that and, and are willing to work with specific audiences, like prepared audiences, uh, I don't know if this answers the, the question. Thank you. Um, I would like to pass over to uh, Glenn, who has raised her hand uh, to ask a question live. Um, Glenn, are you able to speak? Can we hear? Can you hear me? Oh yes. Can we see? Hello. Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Annette, for uh, the, the, the uh, presentation. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you emphasized the tensions in artistic research throughout. And part of, I have a kind of two-part question around that. First of all, um, I think there are some tensions around the tensions in artistic research in the sense that we, even the way you described the sort of first um, um, discussions around artistic research where there was this idea of having to reinvent the wheel and now there's a kind of selection 
of terms and terminologies that we can choose. And in some of the discussion around artistic research at this time, there's a temptation, especially within supervision, to assume that we have gotten to a place beyond those tensions and that somehow we don't need to revisit these questions and, and that um, they just need to be left in the past. And in some senses, there is a potential lack of pr productivity there or productive engagement. T tensions can be very productive. There's also, potentially, there's also potentially an ethical problem there when it comes to supervision and uh, researchers where if, if, if supervisors are, um, if you like, uh, negating these tensions, uh, oftentimes the res it is the researcher who in a very vulnerable place is managing and negotiating those tensions. And in particular, in relation to institutions, the, the, the researcher becomes the bearer of an awful lot of responsibility around the, the, the valuation of the research in, in terms of what kind of um, uh, research, whether it's artistic or uh, practice led or um, uh, practice based, etc. So my question, I suppose, is around what is the role of a supervisor in an artistic research um, process, bridging the vulnerability of a researcher deciding on a particular type of research, be it practice-led, practice-based, based, and the final evaluation of that by an institution that may or may not see that as a welcome um, type of research in the university. Sorry, it's a bit long-winded. That's why I didn't write well, it. <laughs> I'm not sure if I understood. The role of the supervisor is uh, difficult. The role of the supervisor is difficult, but, uh, but um, this is also the importance of the supervisor is different in different cultures. So, um, of course, a lot of artistic research, the supervisors have not made a, a doctorate in art themselves. So, for instance, my supervisors were a historian and a theater director. And, and the theater director, who was a brilliant woman, but she said, these parts of the text I don't read. Point. That was clear. Fair enough. And then with the historian, I started to really explain how do you make a rehearsal? You know, you, you know I started to, to sort of make a model from cardboard to explain how you make theater to him. And then he had the, the sense to realize that now you, I should send you to a professional because so, so how, now this is not answering. This is uh, just mem sort of reminiscencing. But it's very, very, supervisors are very important. And uh, unfortunately, every supervisor is limited to that experience that they have. Mm -hmm. So it's not possible. Uh, you can't believe the supervisor understands everything. That's why it's sometimes very good to have um, two supervisors if, if, if they can meet and so on. Uh, but uh, um, the, the, the responsibilities with the artist, with the doctoral candidate. And uh, it's also possible to change supervisor. I've, I've had two, two supervising relationships that were broken in the middle because I was not the right person. It was, okay. it, it's heavy, it's, it's really heavy, but it, that needs to be uh, possible. Um, but how should I say, somehow trying to articulate the tensions you are working with is the task because the supervisor can't articulate your tensions. And, and these tensions, uh, I listed a lot of different tensions, but of course only one or two are relevant in each case. So, but then the question of what the sort of institutional needs, I, there was just, there was just uh, the historically first uh, case in, in Stockholm where a uh, where, uh, doctoral dissertation was failed by the committee. And I'm not going to discuss that further, but it was like a oh, big thing and nobody expected that. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Annette. Um, I think I would like to jump on now to a question about um, evaluation or examination following mm -hmm. this discussion on supervision. In terms of in terms of evaluating projects in life theater performances, particularly when the examiner is not able to see or experience the work, the question is how does then is it possible to evaluate a production that doesn't follow the traditional expectation of a theater piece and therefore it can be rejected in um, outside the academic circles. Well, uh, here I would like to say that there has been a, there was a, a policy both in 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 uh, Helsinki and in Stockholm that that live performances, if they are artworks, not data or material for the for the report, but if they are outcomes, they should be. Uh, examined live. So we've had people come from Australia to Helsinki to look at the show. But that's not uh, uh, the whole thing. It's the position of the, because of course, uh, not everybody will be able in the future to see that show live. So what do you extract from that show that you can share with people who are not there? So uh, there was in Stockholm, like Mal Malin Arnell uh, uh, did, did a, was it 48 hour show where, where uh, examiners were supposed to participate and sort of do it. Mm, I think that it's some, in some sense, it's a dead end to, to stress the live experience too far because we're generating knowledge and experience that needs to be shared globally and from one generation to the next. So it's not, uh, although I understand the importance of the live moment and I think uh, uh, it's a right policy to examine live performances live. Uh, it's not an excuse for not trying to articulate what is important in the show for that research project. Yes. Um, what about, you make a strong point regarding the tensions between, there's a couple of questions on methodology, so I'll try to uh, summarize them. Um, you speak about the tension between proposing a new methodology and following already existing traditional methodologies. And obviously there is different kind of value in this, uh, different types of work. And the question is addressed to both Annette and Yvonne um, in terms of what are your perceptions in terms of the differences between academic areas within the performance arts, uh, music, theatre, dance, and also uh, geographical areas such as, uh, it was interesting to hear about the Nordic context, but what about what's happening in terms of methodology in Australia, US, if there's any thoughts um, on that tension between proposing new methodologies and following existing methodologies. Well, let me, let me sort of take a big supporter here. I take Karen Barat with me because she mentions in some case that, that um, it's not important that it's Karen Barat. She's a queer theorist and physicist, but she, she has really, uh, in, 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 uh, in another context, she explained that we tend to think that methodologies are like something that exists on a shelf and you can just, now I have this project and then I take this methodology and then we go by the book. And this is not true, not even in science. The methods are invented for each case. They have to be, they have to be created re in relationship to the question. So traditional methodologies, they're, they're just a sort of loose starting point. Now, for me personally, I've been writing about and claiming, uh, I'm not so sure about it any longer, but, but that artists should develop methodology, their sort of the general methodology of artistic research, artists should develop methods based on their working methods. So instead of, of applying sort of uh, social sciences methodo methodology, like uh, taking interview methods and so on, you, of course you can do that if it helps you. But basically the challenge is how can I, in my way of making art, how can I translate my way of making art? How can I articulate it and systematize it so that I can use that as a method. That's the challenge and it doesn't work for everybody, but, but to, to, and therefore when we speak of like uh, methods and questions go together. So the problem in most artists uh, already have a method or several methods in some sense. So 
how to find a question that you can answer with that method. You can't, uh, like uh, I'm performing for camera, doing time-lapse works, I can't uh, uh, answer any uh, old question. I, why are trees growing as they grow? Well, with my method of making art, I, I can't answer that question. So, but, but the main, my main suggestion is that, that uh, at least uh, even if you use traditional methods from outside your own artistic discipline or traditional ways of working within the discipline, you have to adapt it to your own project. Was this somehow what? Uh, yes, I think it uh, covers a range of questions on uh, um, methodologies, uh, whether a student might be proposing new tradition, new methodologies. Um, I think it, you just cover um, all that. Um, there's only a couple more questions. Um, whether you think it's uh, important to present a piece of work, not only within the academic setting, but outside um, the academic setting. So whether to present a performance piece which is research-based outside the academic context rather than just in the academy. And I guess this question is about the context of where the PhD research and artistic research lives. Uh, the, the academic context is one of them, but what, what, what other context might there be for our work? Well, it's rarely, it's, it's sort of all kinds of, especially performing arts, it's very difficult to present in an academic context, except in very small parts. If it's very, um, so if you work with like uh, more traditional theater shows, for instance, there are rarely uh, facilities for creating that in a purely academic context. So there is already a need to collaborate with the, uh, do transdisciplinary research to collaborate with uh, institutions outside the academia. But uh, then I'm going back to the question of, of some work that is experimental uh, cannot easily find a, a sort of a, a place in the commercial art world, whereas other type of work uh, could more easily find a place within the commercial art world. But then, of course, uh, if you make site-specific work, you could try to find specific audience and so on. Um, I think it's very rare that some work would be only sort of, if you have an audience, that it would be only, or depending on what you mean by academia, because in some sense, traditional performance art communities are like very closed. Also, there is a, 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 the idea that, that uh, or like avant-garde practices, that, that the audience knows what you're talking about. If you go to a poetry reading, it's not like the general audience that goes to the poetry reading, but it's people who read poetry and who write poetry, and then they discuss about the poetry reading. So the, I, I believe in the sort of specialized audiences, not necessarily within academia, but, you know, uh, this is maybe not, um, it depends on the project. It depends on the project, that's clear. And uh, thank you so much for mapping out all the um, tensions uh, in your uh, video earlier today. There must uh, be more, there must, there be, must more. be more. And there is a last question here which speaks about whether it might be useful for a researcher to establish where they position themselves within that map of tensions that you spoke. Would that be an interesting but exercise or? But, but wait, I'm going to interrupt because we're getting close to time. <laughs> So what I'm going to let that question hang and that, you know, everyone that may want that question answered or have other questions, please feel free to put them into the chat now and we will follow up with answering as many of them as we can or transmitting them onward um, so that we can keep tight to time. I'm just going to, first of all, um, uh, as chair here, just say, um, come back to something you said that I've written down, Annette, here. Uh, um, and this is paraphrasing you, so it's not the correct vocabulary. Right. You asked the question, how can I systematize my practice so that I can use it as a method? And I think um, um, what delights me about you raising that possibility and that question is that there are large institutions and territories where it is the transplantation of methods from social sciences or other areas that's valued inside uh, the artistic doctorate. 
And I think what's so delightful about you raising that way of thinking is one of our current social challenges is to really think about what inside and outside academia artistic thinking has to offer a wider culture. And actually these idiosyncratic methods that artists spend lifetimes uh, um, developing, these idiosyncratic and changing methods, these kinds of methods are methods that are adaptable, flexible, contingent, they cope with chaos. And um, what we really need right now are research methods that cope with chaos. We definitely do. Sure, so. Sure, sure. We, we have something to offer the wider world that often um, the academic community doesn't understand that we have to offer. So thank you for, for um, articulating that so delightfully. The other thing I just want to say is since coming to Ireland, um, uh, in every culture there tends to be words or terms that have a deep feeling inside the culture. And I uh, adore how in Ireland people say that they're delighted um, it's one of these words that feels like people really mean it in, inside Irish culture. So I just like to say how delightful I repeatedly find the way you present Annette and how delighted I am that you were able to join us. Uh, I personally always come away from how you talk about artistic research feeling really inspired. And so thank you so much for Good. being here. <laughs> And thank you everyone else uh, that's attended today, all of the attendees and panelists and Inesh for your excellent chairing and Jules for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll thank just you. close. Thank you so much, Annette. Thank you, Yvonne, and our postdoctoral um, researcher, Inesh Bento Coelho. Um, I'm just going to close now. Thank all of you for um, coming today. Um, we have nearly 50 of us here online, and it's a kind of extraordinary testament to the moment that we are doing this and also the possibilities as well as the challenges of doing that. So thank you for staying with us. Um, I wanted to um, just pick up on the fact that there was really interesting discussion today about supervision. So we have a presentation, um, one of our seminars on the 20th of August um, is specifically focused on uh, supervising artistic research doctorates. Um, and we have, um, we're very pleased to have Michaela Glanz coming from um, the University of Vienna and she's leading an Erasmus Plus project, which is specifically focused on, ha on research, on supervising artistic research PhD. So do come back for that. Um, meanwhile, our next session, next Thursday, um, the 16th of July is focused on film. And we're delighted to have um, Andrea Breit, um, who is also from the University of Vienna. And um, we hope very much to see you then. So do go to our website and, um, and register for that and hope to see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.